Well, welcome. Today's uh, conversation is going to be focusing in on our board matrices, uh, with board matrices, which our uh, network has put out already. And I have with us uh, Kara Maxud, who is on the board at Zavarian in Brooklyn. So in a moment, she'll talk a little bit about her experience uh, with board matrix use in our governance committees. At a high level, a lot of these uh, matrices can help boards assess you know, true diversity uh, and composition uh, within the directors or the trustees. But what, what's meant by that is more than just looking at the gender, the race, ethnicity of a board, but also looking at the talents and the skill sets and the influence uh, that our directors bring. And so again, I've asked Kara to uh, speak a little bit about her background relative to these board matrices, and we'll uh, start with that. So Kara, if you could just go ahead and introduce yourself to the group. Hi, how are you? Um, my name is Kara Maxud. I was a Genesis um, graduate, 1992. So I've, I hold Severian near and dear to my heart. I've been on the board for about five years um, and I've worked a lot in the nonprofit sector, um, mostly as an operations officer and, and finance you know, committees. Um, and really what I've seen in these board matrix, which I'm thrilled to kind of chat about is how easy it makes doing the work of building the board, maintaining the board, and sustaining the board really for the for everyone who's working on it. Um, as, as terms are over and whatnot, this really, this tool really comes in super handy. Great. So Kara, I'm going to pop up a uh, board matrix that you have used in some of your work. And if you just want to kind of talk about some of the best practices, I'm particularly interested in how you as a board went about and filled filled a matrix like this out. Was it one or two folks? Was it the whole board involved? But just speak to some of the high level uses of this. Yeah. So we, um, so to start, before we even have our board fill it out um, with newer nonprofits or, you know, with established ones, I always take the main people and just have them take a look at this and be like, what would be the most helpful to have, right? So, so I know what I'm kind of looking for, right? If you're um, a smaller nonprofit and strategic planning is really what you're going to need over the next five years. Like we got to focus in on that. So those are the kind of people we're looking for. You know, if you're an established board, you probably need a little bit of everything. Um, but just to kind of get a high level of like what we're thinking of. I, in the past, have always had everyone fill it out. And usually we've done it two ways where people just go across the you know, uh, across the, the grid and say, okay, accounting, finance, and this was um, specifically, this was a, for our animation nonprofit. So that's why you see animation there um, and kind of put a check. I've also done it where we put numbers one through 10. So we know how skilled you are in something because what people tend to do, and, and this is not a, a dig on anyone, but they want to be good at creative arts wanting to be good at creative arts and actually being good at creative arts, right? So when you give people that one through 10, sometimes you get a better assessment. Um, what I will say is when we've had board members do it individually and we just do it as checkbox, we do have a group kind of go back over it and then look at what people put and then make an assessment themselves. And we do that based on what we know you do for a living or what we know you've been involved in in the past. And that just helps us know, look, if you clicked creative arts, but you're an actuary, I'm gonna guess you might not be a 10 on the creative arts scale. Maybe you are, but for the most part, you might not be, right? So we recognize that you, and, and look, if you wanna be part of creative arts and this is your volunteer work, we want you to be part of that group. So then that allows us to know maybe we put you on one committee in finance and then one committee with the creative arts group, right? To give you, because also let's recognize people come on boards, they wanna feel good about the work they're doing. So we have to get through this matrix, not only knowing the actual of what you're good at, but maybe what your desires are, where you get to step out of, you know, what you do in your everyday life. Um, so, so I would recommend doing it two ways, either check boxes across the things you think you're skilled in or a one through 10. Again, we, 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 we look at the one through 10 because it allows us to know where your strong skills are. And then that maybe gives us an opportunity to look at, you know, something you might be interested in. Um, I've also seen people do it color coded. I wouldn't recommend that because you have to do that kind of visual um, where you need all those papers. Um, 
we have always had someone then collaborate all this information, mm -hmm. right? Because let's say we have 10 board members. So let's go back, um, if you can, Patrick, scroll back over. So we'll put the 10 board members down, right? And then we've got person A has time. He's got, let's say he checks time, meaning he's got a lot of time or he's got a give or get, he's got a big Rolodex, right? So at the bottom, we can tally that up. What if nobody checked talent and we really need that? So that allows us to know at the bottom what we're really missing. You know, we're gonna need people to show up. We're gonna need people to bring money. We're gonna need people to give us time. We're gonna need people to give us talent. So then that gives us an idea. Again, that's why the one through 10 is really helpful. Because if we have 10 people and we know we can give up to 10, we know at the bottom, we know we're looking for a score of 100. And anything we don't have a score of 100 in, where are we lacking? And then we can look back through. Um, one of the other, um, if we can scroll over, one of the other really good ones um, that I always like is in the demographics with the age range. Now that's not going to be a one through 10, right? That's going to be people's age. But what it allows us to do is it allows us based on how many people we are filling out, we can add that all up and divide by that number of people. And we know what the average age on our board is. And then we know by what we're choosing, right? So for instance, in the Severian type board, right? We know the children that we're servicing are ages sixth grade through 12th grade. And so if our board starts to get really, really heavy on the older age, but we know we're trying to service a younger group, right? But now are we adding in, you know, how we have um, with our Severian board, I forget what we call the Walters and the Mark Spellmans. They're the staff of Severian, but they come to our meetings, right? They would be people I would actually add in here because they're going to bring our age down and they're going to let us know that we're really getting closer to the age of the people we're trying to serve, right? And again, everybody's perspective on this could be different, but this is tools to help you instead of having to think, oh, Patrick's this age, Kara's that age, brother Larry's this age. Like we don't have to do all of that. This will give us a quick Look, and then when you have somebody who's rolling off the board, right, because you know their term's coming to an end, you can go in and delete them from the matrix or do a, a like, modeled out what, the, what it's going to look like. You know, next year you can just copy and paste this and drop it on sheet one and say, this is what we're going to look like in 2022, 2023. In our, you know, our example, we knew we lost Bill Zucker, you know, because his term was up. So if we would have known that a year ago, could we have then put our feelers out there to kind of replace someone at that level who had that skill set, not just in age, but in all the skills that he possesses? If we delete him out or we hide his, his skill sets, we can look at what that does. And then we are able to do a comparison tool of like, okay, this is what our board looks like right now. Once we lose this person, this is, and then overlay the two numbers. So we know where we're missing, you know, where we're gonna, we're gonna have holes in our board. Does that, am I making sure. sense? Yeah, Kara, can I ask one clarifying question? So you mentioned sure. the names, you know, Mark and, and Walter. So the CFO of the school, the admissions director, are you suggesting that from your experience, have you guys put those folks, if they're at board meetings, if they're bringing their talents, that you track that as well? I, I do. Um, and because they often run committees, right? Mm -hmm. Like they often, so we want to make sure, again, right, the big, we know that the best boards function when the subcommittees really do, you know, the nitty gritty work. So we know the subcommittees are often run by the, the staff of the organization um, and having them be able to know who they have on their team, right, is, is super valuable. And then knowing what their skill set is as well, because look, we want to get to the most well-rounded, most prospective, biggest catching net of a team. Right. And sometimes, you know, I, I know this is always something that people um, you, you get people out of their comfort zone a little bit. But sometimes if everybody on the finance team is all numbers all the time, 
you don't get that that new perspective. Sometimes putting someone who might be not so finance centric on the committee, maybe because they want to learn, maybe because they've expressed in their board matrix, like I would love to be on a finance committee, even though I'm the art teacher or mm-hmm. something, you know, or or in my real life, I'm a I'm a art something or other, allows sometimes they ask the question that forces everybody to kind of like slow down a second and then have to think through something. And that allows for growth, or at least that's what I've that's my perspective on it. So often this matrix can you know, kind of serve multiple different, it gives people a way to kind of express what they're interested in. It gives the board, the the president of the school and the people that are working at the school good to know who they have, right? Think about it, baseball teams, basketball teams, you know who your players are and you know who your backups are and you know if you lose somebody who's got to go sit in for that person, this board matrix should serve the same way. Yep, great. I'm going to pop up the other one that our network has disseminated because it's, I think you made another good point. Um, Let's get this enlarged here. All right. Are you able to see that Word document on the screen? So, for example, on the um, this areas of expertise, what I what I think you were suggesting earlier is whether somebody's using the instrument that you put out or uh, the one that we have in the network, you know, this, this is not meant to be so cookie cutter that you would encourage boards to, you know, consider what areas are here. And if, again, if they're, well, I have strategic planning in there, but if there's some aspect of board functioning that's not covered here, absolutely to go ahead and put it in, you know, to modify these areas of expertise yep. in the local context of the board, and then to go ahead and, and measure it via this tool. And a great example is something that's new. If the school, let's say, doesn't have something that you want to bring to the school, let's say you want to bring a robotics team that doesn't exist yet, and you know another school has had it, so you're going to use their model, but bringing somebody on the board who is then going to, you know, have a little bit of experience or maybe has some expertise with it, because they're going to be the advocate for the kids then. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And then maybe one other question I have, as I've heard from a few folks, is just kind of the confidentiality of this information. I mean, obviously, if if the whole board is asked to fill this out, I mean, do you, do you have any thoughts or recommendations? You know, who who really is the keeper of this information? I I would say from how we're setting up this governance committee that it would be the head of the school with the governance committee. Is it a document though, from experience that you know, then turning around and sharing with the whole board, or would you suggest it kind of remain at committee level? Do you have thoughts on that? I have to be honest with you. We've always done it kind of as a big board exercise in all the places I've done it in the past. Um, because it's there's no give when that give get question from the other one, there's no amount. It's just what you're saying you're going to, you know, want to spend your energy doing. Um, in this case, I feel that, you know, a conversation around some of these things might be helpful to people. You might not think that you're great or you'd be awesome at doing, you know, one of these um expertise, let's say, but maybe it is something that other people see you, oh, you know, Patrick, every time you talk in the meeting, it's really helpful because you're always three steps ahead thinking you're a great strategic planner, but you don't think of yourself as that. So, you know, if if that's something that people are seeing as, as something you bring to the table and other people are finding it useful, then why not utilize that. Again, we're a collective group of people. We all recognize we're not doing this work as individuals. We get the work done as a team. So if I know you've got that covered, well, maybe I can, you know, help out in another area that would be better, you know, and it might not be my expertise, but maybe I can focus on it, or maybe I can bring something to the team that is focusing on it. Um, but we want it to be truthful. So I, I don't want to, I don't want you to think we're getting too far away. Like, oh, this is all, you know, in theory, I want to be good at this. But I think what we have often is people are human nature just has us be a little bit shy, right? Like if you're really great at all of these things, would you truly be comfortable being like, yeah, I'm great at administration. I'm great at education. I'm great at, right? Like you might feel like a self-assessment. You're like, I don't want to, 
go around telling everybody I'm great at this, but you are great at all those things. So the board needs to know that because we want to be able to utilize that. And as a board, we're like, that's awesome because you then can be utilized in a bunch of areas. Maybe we don't have somebody in every single area. So if you don't care which area you wind up in and you're good at all of these things, let us know that so then we can use you as a, a player who can go any to any committee, right? So yeah. I think often it gets looked at as self-assessment and people get maybe self-conscious of that, but it's really to let us know what we have as a team. So I think it's to be up to the board. I've always, the way we've done it in the past is have everybody fill out the sheet individual, but in a group setting. And then the keeper of the sheet, and usually it's been the administration of whoever, you know, the president or the CEO or the executive director of the organization is, is kind of compiling all of it, like bringing it all to one spreadsheet. So we have all the board members on one of it. And we have it all laid out. I've seen it done where we've, you know, had pie charts, again, for a lot of grants that we've gone for in the non you know, Catholic education department, we've had to show that we're, you know, super diversified or, you know, super inclusive and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. And graphs and pie charts, those seem to be really great visuals when you're writing grants. You know, and I think one of the other items you had suggested, which could translate into a visual, but I think it's another way to look at this. I think how I've seen these matrices used in the past is more the checkbox, but I think you make an interesting point on the ranking one to 10, because again, I mean, you could take something like technology and <laughs> if one is, is the low and 10 is the high, I mean, it's another way, you know, beyond just checkboxes to really get a better read on, uh, you know, the self-assessment of how good the board is and supporting technology needs. So I think that that's an interesting aspect for our boards to consider beyond just a checkbox, but rather a ranking. And it does give you solid numbers. So you can kind of see, again, sustainability is always something, you know, that we know on boards becomes, right? Because you get so comfortable with everybody's on the board and the recruiting of new members sometimes gets lost in the mix and then people's terms are up. And so you'll really be able to know what's, coming ahead in the future of what you're going to lose percentage wise of what you have and then you can really be out looking for the right you know individuals great well care any other high level uh comments that we didn't talk about that you'd like to pass on to other trustees and directors no just that you know this exercise does take a bit of time it's not a it's not a five minute exercise i have seen quite a few places where people want to talk about it and again, it's, it's a self-assessment. And if you've got long-term board members, I think it's worth the time. You know, I would highly recommend it in a setting, you know, if you do a retreat type setting or something like that, just because you give people an activity before it. And then it seems to be a little bit more, uh, less uh, uncomfortable when they're doing their self-assessment. Excellent. Very good. Well, Carrie, I very much appreciate your insights and we appreciate all the work you do at Zavarian on the board. So thank you for your time.